Welcome everybody to, I guess, what's considered the Game Wisdom Live Redux this week. Yesterday, when I was all set to stream and get everything going, my internet decided to lose all of its upstream, which isn't good when you're trying to broadcast. So, we're trying it again, and for those of you who did manage to get on in time, this first part will pretty much be a repeat. But, first thing, I uh, this is of course Game Wisdom Live for the week of August 11th, 2017. We are working now with, or I'm now using OBS the Studio version, which means I can now mess with things, move them around like so. It's all going to be uh, snappier and fancier. This also means it should be a lot clearer or easier to set up different, you know, effects here, there, and everywhere. For those of you watching this also right now, please let me know what you think in terms of audio. Because a new setup means brand new settings for sound and such. So, if I'm not coming in too clear, if whatever game I'm playing sounds too low, let me know. Also, for those of you watching this live or record, if people do happen to come on and start talking, let me know if you can make it out over there. If not, I can of course zoom it in. Or in fact, maybe I should do that right now. Will that help? Yeah, yeah that should be good. And now, thanks to the fact that it's all set up nice and organized, uh, it, there's no more negative space over there for you guys to see. But, uh, please welcome, of course, while he's still in the midst of mid-moving, co-founder of Any Voyage and streamer Robert Leach. Hey, how you doing? Hey, Rob, it's great to have you on. Sorry about <laughs> pulling you away from unpacking yesterday with all the craziness going on. Oh, I, have no, I, I do not mind being pulled away from <laughs> uh, unpacking. So, how are you doing since we last spoke? I'm doing well. Um, having last spoke yesterday, I'm, I'm really, I'm just looking forward to the weekend now, and hopefully I can get my streaming uh, going tomorrow. Awesome. So, for those of you catching this either live or record, I guess a quick update about what's been going on. Uh, in terms of game wisdom, not much in terms of, uh, like, Patreon or new things along that front, but if you haven't heard of the news, we do have a new Discord channel set up for everyone who donates at least to a dollar or more. And we basically just hang out and talk about video game design topics. And I'm sure one of those will probably be what we're going to be discussing in a few minutes. So if you would like to get in on the fun, uh, be sure to check out patreon.com slash gwbicer. And, uh, let me see if there's anything else along that front. Yeah, we did the updates. Also, I will be posting, because of the whole uh, you to the Game Wisdom Live being delayed, kind of pushed things back for me working on the podcast. So, my podcast will be going up tomorrow afternoon. We're going to be talking Kickstarter tips with Ed Healy of Gamerati. We spent almost two hours talking about all manner of suggestions and ways to improve Kickstarter campaigns and some of the bigger do's and don'ts. Also, this Tuesday around, I believe, 4 or 4.30, it'll probably be good if I pull up my email really fast, we're going to be having a live chat with the developers of Kingdom of Loathing and West of Loathing. And that is 4.30 Eastern on August 15th, so that'll be the Tuesday there. So be sure to come in, say hi, and we'll be talking all about development of the Loathing franchise. And I may have a second developer interview to announce for later that week. I'm in the middle of talking with the lead designer of the Shrouded Isle from Kid Fox Games, so we may be setting up a double live cast next week. But more details once we've uh, narrowed things down. But I guess for you, Rob, do you have any like interesting news or games uh, you've been working with with Indie Voyage? Uh, no, um, we are we have, at the moment we have uh, no games that we are working on. We have Venture Forth that's out right now mm -hmm. that we're still trying to work with. Uh, but at the moment, we we might be switching gears a little bit. I guess more on that uh, as that unfolds. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's that's what's going on. And I haven't had a chance to really sit down and play any games or read much news uh, <laughs> since this last week and a half has been so chaotic. Ah uh, yes. Let me double check things here to make sure things are selling good. Yeah. And I know it's been a crazy time. I'm right now preparing my two present, two new presentations that will be starting in September, 
and I have to finish up my GDC submission along with that whole ebook idea. So that's been kind of what I've been doing in my off time. I did get a press copy for Res Infinite, which I'm really excited to show off, especially for the PC fans who may not know about that game. Have you heard of Res Infinite before, Rob? I have not. I feel like I've uh, heard of Res, <laughs> but that's about it. It is a um, shooter basically built around synthesia, so like the uh, merging of senses. So the idea is that the music causes the environment to like undulate and or oscillate to the beat. And it's kind of like very, it's a very trippy game. It's one of those games that if you happen to take any kind of recreational drugs, for those of you in those certain states, it's definitely one of those games to play with it. But it's been on the PS2, Xbox, I believe it's even been on PSN. So this is the uh, latest version of it. It includes Oculus Rift and Vive support, which I don't have access to, but that will probably make things even trippier to play. And um, also, some interesting news, I just got an email from Sega last night about putting in a request for uh, the next Yakuza game to be coming out. I think we talked about Yakuza a few months ago, didn't we? Uh, we did. We mentioned it um, a little bit. I know that, oh my gosh, I have the game. and I have. It's one of those games I have and haven't played. It's, it's strange. I have it on PS2, <laughs> or one of them anyway. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. It started on the PS2, so they're basically going through and uh, remaking all the original versions. You know, using updated graphics, uh, trying to get the voice actors from the modern Yakuza to reprise their role, stuff like that. So the one that's due out, I think, in a few weeks, is going to be the remake of the original. The one that came out a few months ago was a prequel to the whole series. So it'll be interesting to see what they're doing with. I forget the um, prefix that they're using for the new Yakuza game, but I'm generally excited to see what's going to go on with it, and fingers crossed I'll be able to get a press copy of it. Yeah, that'll be cool. I'd mm -hmm. like to see that. Yeah, I did put in for a press copy for uh, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, or whatever it's called, so here's uh, wondering if I will get that, and then I can join all the other streamers in getting killed in that game. <laughs> always something to look forward to mm -hmm. have you played any uh, player unknown yet i have not let me let me look it up <laughs> uh, my 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 not having played things is only going to get worse as of uh, you know after this move so let's just see here oh okay so i've seen a little bit of it yeah <laughs> i think i've seen some streamers uh play around with it mm -hmm. can't seem to one second here your little uh, Skype window doesn't seem to be popping up. It seems to be stuck on some advertisement for something. So. Yeah, I saw that. I don't. I don't know what is going on. You can always remove that part, and one of these days I'll get back to when my when my little quote office slash closet <laughs> is is worth looking at. Then I'll be uh, doing actual visual stuff. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Rob was telling me right before we started, like, is your like mic uh, staying like precariously on a box right now? Is it like yes, it is. <laughs> I have an empty suitcase that it is balanced on right now, so hopefully there are no like minor earthquakes over here. Knock on wood. <laughs> I am in Los Angeles. You never know. Uh -hmm. I'm still here on the East Coast. I think we're about to get like another big rainstorm over the weekend, though. So we'll <laughs> see what happens internet-wise over the next few days. Yeah, every other week I feel like I'm hearing some news about your weather. Yeah, <laughs> every week it seems like we're in some crazy storm or whatnot. Yeah. Uh, let's see, I did have a record podcast this week. I spoke with uh, two of the people behind the indie game The Dark Side Detective. It's like a uh, pixel-based adventure game. Like, very light-hearted but supernatural themes to it. They were a lot of fun. That podcast should be going up in a few weeks, and hopefully I can get them on for one of these live casts one of these days. Yeah, that'll be cool. Mm -hmm. Now, I guess, in terms of other things I've been trying to get around to play, uh, let's see. Um, oh, yeah, I played um, Halcyon 6, the latest version of the game. Uh, this was a game sort of like a... Um, Kind of combination of like people describe as like sort of XCOM meets Star Control 2. Like you have like ship battles, but you're managing like your whole space station kind of thing. 
and they just released like a complete updated version of the game completely new systems completely new mechanics and it kicked my ass in about an hour and 40 minutes of streaming it oh my god hey El Gordo uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, while you're on, how are you? Um, is the text coming in clear on the little YouTube box? Because it's kind of hard for me to see while I'm talking here. But yeah, I'm going to maybe try recording some more of it or playing it like in my spare time. But for those of you watching this live tonight, I will be going back to West of Loathing later this evening when we're done with our little chat here, and. Oh yeah, I don't think you were on last week, but do you know about the whole Kingdom of Loathing uh, game? I don't. I don't. That is a game from way back in the day. I was playing that back in college. It's a uh, browser-based free-to-play game. Pretty much you're set in the stick-figure world uh, filled with humor and all manner of weird things. And the game's been going pretty much non-stop. Let me see. Maybe I can make it a little bit bigger. Oh, this is cool. Is this, uh, this isn't by the guy who did, um, oh god, Candy Box, is it? I don't know. I mean, I guess it, it doesn't look like it quite, but I, you know, I always think when I see an online game that has some simplistic uh, look to it, I always think Candy Box. <laughs> All right. I just uh, made the uh, text box a little bit bigger. I zoomed in. Uh, let me know if that's any better for you. But, um, yeah, so King of Loathing, it's been, wow, they've been, it's been free the entire time, and for a time I was hooked on it back in college, so I finally broke away from it, and now I'm just trying to uh, get into West of Loathing, which I'm really enjoying. It's basically a single-player RPG set in a Wild West version of that world. So your three classes you can choose are either a Cow Puncher, a uh, Snake Oiler, or a pasta mancer. No, a bean mancer. You use uh, beans as your magic spells in the game. So, if that didn't clue you in, West of Loathing is not a super serious game. <laughs> like, you can get all manner of, like, weird and random perks by doing, like, <laughs> just, like, random stuff. Like, if you really book at the beginning, you unlock stupid walking. So every time you start walking, your guy does some kind of like crazy walking animation. Like uh, he does the worm, he'll do the moonwalk. He may start doing like cartwheels around uh, the Russian uh, dance. I forget the name of it, and so on. And it's just a very crazy game to play, but it works. And just in terms of how well the mechanics are put together, um, there's this funny part where. Uh, you try to explain to a miner uh, how the machines work, even though you have no idea, and you get the Mind Splainer edition or Mind Splainer perk, even though you have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> it says that on the description. You pretend you think that you know what you're talking about, but you don't. <laughs> That's pretty funny. I, I want to say, I'm looking at it now, and I swear to God, I don't know how old this is. Do you, do you have a, uh, any idea? Uh, Kingdom, Kingdom of Loathing. Loathing. Well, I was playing it in college. That was like probably like 2004. So it's over a decade old at this point, easily. So yeah, I must have I must have touched on it at some point. It just the the, the sign in interface just seems so familiar. But obviously, I'm gonna have to get reacquainted because mm. uh, it uh, it's right up my alley in terms of humor, obviously, or maybe <laughs> not obviously, but uh, <laughs> looking at it, I should say. But yeah, and West of Loathing is really a lot of fun. Again, it's one of those weird games that it doesn't take itself seriously, not even in terms of the game mechanics. So if you're looking for like a hardcore RPG, it's not going to be it. But it's definitely made for people who want to laugh to the story with a pretty decent combat system. It's all turn-based, and... Um, you can basically mess with your opponents. Like, items are a big deal. It's kind of similar to, like, the Paper Mario series from Nintendo in terms of, like, how powerful items can be. Leaving an item that just does, like, 50 damage to the entire enemies. You can get some of that boost your defense. But battles are also very quick. Like, this is a game where most matches will probably take no more than two minutes. And... You will pretty much know very quickly if you are going to win, or that the guy's just going to like pop you and knock you out in a few smacks. 
Uh, That's good. I always like a good battle system. So mm -hmm. it seems like the the origins of this game, moving on to to the kind of game that uh, uh, West of Loathing appears to be, mm -hmm. uh, seems like an interesting step forward. Yeah. And what I found like very interesting, I think we've probably talked about this at some point, but I really like that aesthetic of the game. Like obviously, it's not going to be beating Doom 2016 in terms of graphics, but it's a very like consistent aesthetic like the whole world is built around it and for those of you who watched the live play you didn't even get to see some of the crazier imagery in that game that happens like three hours in i'm sure el gordo if you've been playing it like non-stop like i have you may have gotten to some of the parts i'm thinking of but we'll probably get to it tonight on the stream but it looks very impressive despite looking so like low-key in a matter speaking yeah i love it when when developers can take uh, a simple aesthetic like this or at least seemingly simple mm -hmm. and then and then uh own it and make it amazing i feel like one of the the worst things that i i enjoy about some of the retro graphics is that a lot of people use it as a crutch because mm -hmm. in a lot of ways it can be easier to draw and manage but when you when you really get into it, you can make a game that is very dip, de deep and impressively um, uh, aesthetic just by, you know, just by really embracing it and going for it uh, mm -hmm. instead of just like, oh, I all I can do is stick are stick figures. Therefore, that's what I'm going to do with this game. You know, you make it all about that. I mean, you really, like mm -hmm. you say, make it the center, make it a centerpiece. Maybe you fully come into it. Oh, so you haven't gone past the railroad yet, Goto. Yeah, so the crazier stuff happens past the railroad section. And that was where my kind of um, uh, point of demarcation was last time. Like, I couldn't go past it. But now that the game is out, I am free to do almost anything that I want with it for the stream. But yeah, like stuff like um, Renown Explorers was a really good example. Like, that graphics was a whole, obviously, a lot better. Uh oh. Did I lose? Uh, Rob, are you still there? Uh oh. I'm here. I'm here. Ah, I'm getting some kind of weird uh, Skype connecting thing. Maybe that weird thing was on my end, but if you're still on, we should be good. Hopefully Skype right. will... Maybe it's Skype's turn to stop working. We'll see. <laughs> it's always Skype's turn to stop working. It mm -hmm. seems to be its job. Yeah. But um, as I was saying, like, uh, Renowned Explorers by Abbey Games was another really great example of that strong, unified aesthetic. And it is one of those things, like, you can really see that care in games that really go the distance in terms of their art style. <laughs> Skynet. <laughs> yes. And, well, I think it's also another really great example, like, from the independent space, because obviously, I think you're probably aware as much as I, that we've seen a lot of inventive art styles from any developers. Again, getting around the fact that they don't have access to, you know, Unreal 4 Doom 2016 uh, graphics engines. Yeah, and I, I do feel like that is a major um, that is a major approach when you're making an indie game is that um, you have to make it look intriguing. Like there is no way around it. You can have the best game in the world, but if people don't, um, you know, take a second glance when they look at your page, if if it doesn't look amazing, if it doesn't, it's not that it has to look amazing, but it does have to look uh, eye catching in a mm -hmm. in a good way, not in a bad way. Uh, so if it does that, then you you basically it's like a storefront kind of thing. If the storefront looks um, good, then people will go in. If it doesn't, they'll just move on to the next thing because Steam is so loaded with games and so willing to let you move from one to the next. Mm hmm. Definitely. And like speaking about like games that look uh, striking or such, um, have you seen any screenshots of the Shrouded Isle yet? No, I haven't. Let me keep. Is that on Steam, or is that just something I need to search for? Uh, that is on Steam, yeah. So that was the latest game by uh, Kid Fox Games, and they went with one hell of a uh, art style for it. Oh, that looks great. Yeah, It's also very painful on the eyes, too, like if you're watching that full screen. So I'm hoping that they'll get around to like either toning it down, come up with more color palette options. But yeah, that is one of those games that when you go that page, it definitely hits you in terms of its art aesthetic. Yeah, they're like, uh, we really liked what the Game Boy looked like back in the day. We're just going to make that, um, you know, mm -hmm. 1080p or whatever. Yeah, and whew, wait, I'm just glad when I streamed it that I was uh, 
switching in and out between that and Steam Chat because I could just imagine that game giving me a headache just staring at that nonstop for like an hour and a half. Yeah, that's one of those things I believe that uh, a lot of people aren't aren't cognizant of. I mean, you make a really cool art aesthetic, you don't necessarily remember in your brain that someone has to look at it for hours and hours and hours. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel like the same thing can be said for, um, and this is less likely these days, but developers and designers who don't consider folks who are, have colorblindness. Oh, yes. Um, that's been a big uh, point of discussion over the last uh, decade or so. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I know I spoke with, I can't believe, I forget his name, but we did a live cast, I think, in July about UI testing and UI design. And yeah, it's very easy to create some creatively inventive UI, but at the end of the day, you still have to make something that people can actually follow what's going on. Or it's all for naught. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some games just go over the top, and I, I mean, there's all kinds of systems, and people really love deep systems, but it's so easy to make UI that gets, that just makes people lost all the time. Mm -hmm. It's There is a, definitely an art to making a very accessible UI. <laughs> I know, Gordo, uh, Wes only has a colorblind mode. It doesn't do anything because the game is black and white yet. Yeah. There's yeah. also a nerd mode if you want all the stats and victor figures on the screen. <laughs> yeah, again, it's one of those games where the rapid hole of comedy just keeps going. Uh, yeah. I don't. If you ever play Rob, I don't want to spoil it, but you have to, if you do play it, there's a whole lot of discussions about what happens if you try to reach into uh, spittoons in West of Loathing, yeah. and I won't go any further than that on the stream. I mean, I'm going to have to put it on my wish list. I mean, that is a basically a black hole of game titles, but I am going to have mm -hmm. to keep my eye on that. I'm, I'm probably going to try Kingdom of the Kingdom one, mm. uh, Kingdom of Loathing. Oh, uh, don't get sucked into that one, Rob. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> no promises. And while we've been talking, I just remember one other, well, two other things I forgot to mention that we did yesterday, you know, during the whole uh, curse stream incident. So the first thing is, for those of you watching this live or recorded, I hope you're enjoying the new thumbnail art, the intro music, or intro movies on the Game Wisdom channel. I'm finally pushing forward to the year 2009 on that front. But um, what do you think about some of the new stuff you've had a chance to look at, Rob? Um, I haven't. I, th I thought I had... Uh, here, let me just... No, I'll yeah. have to check. take a look at it. I thought I had looked <laughs> around at it for it a week ago, or sorry, several weeks ago when you first told me that they'd be coming out, but um, I, I must have been in the wrong place or just clicking on the wrong things. I will look at it immediately when we are done. Yeah, but it should be like... You should just be able to pick a, a recent video and it should be featuring the different stuff in Ooh, it now. Well, then I will put that up right now. <laughs> While Rob is doing that, uh, again, I'd like to thank my friend and Game Wisdom site designer, oh. Ken, for putting that stuff together. Ken is my resin uh, butt kicker for me. Like, whenever I'm doing something wrong I need to improve, he's the guy to tell me. So, I did a critical thought or industry insight a few weeks ago about being able to accept bad criticism or being able to accept constructive criticism, and Ken is definitely that guy for me. Like, he's the one who will not... Uh, pull any punches if I'm making a mistake or not having the thumbnail art looking as good as it should. But uh, for those of you watching, please let me know what you think about things, especially about the new intro uh, video. Just to... it is, It's pretty sharp. I like it. <laughs> Thank you. I'll make sure to tell Ken that. He's in our Discord, too. So hopefully cool. he'll be able to hear that. But... Uh, the other thing, I told this joke yesterday, and again, because of the whole thing getting knocked out, we're going to tell it again, but I was a little bit tired yesterday because I was doing all my work in my backyard. Basically, as I was saying the other day, my backyard is the wield from the Darkest Dungeon. It's an incomprehensible mess of vines and bamboo and all manner of foliage I'm sure it doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. And the side of my house is basically no man's land. I don't go back there. It doesn't encroach on our side. So uh, it's just basically an endless battle to keep the backyard sane. I mean, we have these like massive vines and roots that, ro that run all across the of my backyard. It's an obstacle course going back there. So it's like trying to use an edge or trimmer to cut it while avoiding the vines, while avoiding all manner of insects. Like uh, we talked about with the Darkest Dungeon and the whole bloodsucker mosquito thing. 
That's basically where my backyard is. Like, the mosquitoes back there are insane. Like, one year, I swear, I think I got stung, like, 12 times over the course of the summer from mosquito bites. Just, like, standing back there. Uh, but I mean, it yeah. sounds like you've you've described a new game all by yourself right there. <laughs> yeah, Mosquito Fighter. And, of course, I did that after I played nothing but Darkest Dungeon for, like, three weeks uh, with all those bloodsuckers and mosquitoes. And as a uh, tease for an upcoming podcast I did with Chris Barasa of Red Hook, he talked about the inspiration from the for the bloodsuckers as being driven nuts by mosquitoes when he was camping as a child. That was his whole uh, inspiration for the bloodsuckers and the manning wines that they have in the game. So uh, that will be a very fascinating cast that should be going up hopefully in a few weeks at this rate. It looks like uh, Skype decided to calm itself down, but we'll see if it decides to do anything else. I've now, been thinking more and more about switching to Discord for, for calls and stuff. We'll yeah. see. Yeah, we may be doing that here, especially if uh, more people decide to donate to the Patreon we can get more folks in on the Game Wisdom Discord channel. Uh, let's see. News this week. Well, here's something that's interesting that I want to get your thoughts on, Rob, again, with your work in publishing. It was announced a few days ago in a news piece that uh, they did the, they tallied up the numbers from the Steam Direct change that happened a few months ago. And according to sources like Utaku, they're saying about a little over a thousand games were posted to Steam through the Steam Direct feature. And it's got, of course, people, of course, uh, chatting about it on Twitter and Facebook. Some see this as, you know, it's great, more games are getting in, while others feel like the wheel just keeps turning in terms of accessibility issues. Yeah, I figured that, that uh, they would have wanted to have fewer games, like by a good amount. Mm -hmm. um, having that many, I mean, it doesn't solve any indie developers' problems at yeah. all. So, and not, not that it that Steam's job. It's not. Their job is to make money. Uh, but um, certainly for an indie game developer or, or whomever is involved in, a, in an indie game uh, that is getting published, uh, yeah, Steam is becoming less and less your friend. But then again, you know, when you're the only game in town, you, that's just kind of how it goes. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, like we were talking about that, I think, a few weeks ago. I think I was talking about it with another friend. That at the end of the day, Steam has never been your best buddy. They have always been the store. They've just have been the best store. Like again, uh, I, Rob, I think you and I remember the old days before the likes of Steam and buying PC and just general games like that in the big box version. Yeah, yeah, boy, those were the those were interesting days. Uh, I probably remember some earlier days than you at this mm -hmm. point, but yeah, it's it's changed a bit, I would say. Mm hmm. So we're still waiting to see the next big, you know, quote-unquote Steam killer. And I don't know, it's going to be very hard. I know we've spoken about that point before, that for a new store to compete with Steam, they're going to have to basically be better than or equal to Steam of what it is today, not Steam of 2007 or even you could say like 2004 when it was first launched. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, uh, I mean, they're... I, I thought it wasn't possible, but I've been seeing a couple of players that I think might be able to uh, do some damage. Mm -hmm. Mostly Amazon. Mostly Amazon. Mm. Yeah, I know there's one called, I think, Up or Jump or something that, I, that uh, they got like semi-buzz like about a month ago. I haven't heard anything back from them. There's, of course, uh, each I.O. And again, your regulars, GOG, Humble Bundle... But it will be interesting to see if that will happen. And we'll also be very curious to see what will be, I guess, Steam Direct's big uh, um, contribution or impact by the end of 2017. Yeah, and uh, well, I got to say, though, if you're going to compete with Steam, I mean, you need, they have, they have money. They have more money than God at this point. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think Amazon or a company like them might have a chance because they have more money than Valve does. So. Uh, I feel like that's the only way to take them down because if if they really wanted to, any either of those companies could buy up any of those others. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, Amazon owning Twitch is there is the, that's the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. 
And in terms of the whole streaming thing, I did hear some news about um, people having trouble with YouTube, with the ad revenue. Um, it's all been part of that whole big issue that happened a few months ago with major advertisers pulling out. So I'm just wondering what's going to come of that, because I know that in terms of my ad revenue here on YouTube, that things have definitely took a massive hit, at least on my end. And again, I'm more of a small time, so I'm sure for some of the larger people, they have lost quite a bit of money. Yeah, um, and and then that I mean that speaks to a whole different thing. I mean, yeah. your business in terms of streaming and multimedia, it's it's a it's a tough business on its own. And when revenue streams start to dry up here and there for everybody, well, I mean, the people who do it for a living, that's their only means of income. Like, I mean, I know you're almost there at that point to get to that you yeah. know that level, uh, but it just makes it that much harder. And I know a lot of people who have been streaming, and one guy on Twitch in particular, who's actually had to switch gears. I mean, it's already hard enough with all of the competition just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So, um, yeah, it's mm. just a rough business. There are no easy businesses these days. Man, that is definitely true, Rob. And it'll be interesting to see how things will, I guess, play out by the end of this year. Oh, uh, one other Game Wisdom announcement I forgot to mention. Starting this, uh, what I decided is that for our Saturday night streaming, it will kind of be more like of a grab bag. And what I'm going to be doing is opening things up for every Sunday for people to vote for a game they would like to see me stream the following Saturday. So like a, you know, like a casual Saturday night stream kind of deal. So I made a little announcement of a video about a few days ago, but if you would like to suggest a game, uh, when I post my Sunday update, that video will basically be where you can vote. And then for anyone who donates at least $5 or more on Patreon, they'll be able to kind of decide or cast their options for what games I should stream for that Saturday. So if you would like to get on the fun or like to have a control over what I'll be streaming, be sure to check out the Patreon for more information. But um, for this Saturday, I'll just be picking something that I would like to stream. But, again, starting this Sunday, that will kind of be the way forward. So we'll see if there are any takers and such. Yeah, I agree with El Gordo there. Um, that is that is a, a yay from me, too. But it's also very gutsy from your particular standpoint. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just waiting for a Had a Full Boyfriend type game to, to be recommended, and you have to play it then. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that will happen. I'm no... Uh, let's see... Because I've already talked about the games that I don't like to play, so people know my weaknesses by now. It's already been revealed. So, Hatful Boyfriend, let's see, Daddy Simulator. I'm sure someone will suggest Hoon Pop. I can feel it in my bones. Uh, <laughs> El Gordo suggesting the NES version of E.T. Was there a NES version of E.T.? I know, of course, of the Atari, but did they actually... Huh. Actually, I'm sure I don't know if he's there. joking or not. That's the scary part. Wait a minute, I need to look this up. Oh, there is. Oh my god, there really is an E.T. for the NES. <laughs> they, they decided to make another one, apparently. One one uh, terrible thing was not enough. Mm -hmm. Or uh, one of my favorite games growing up, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde for the NES. A oh, I don't remember that. Oh my goodness, that is just a confusing game to play. Um, The Angry, uh, Angry Video Game Nerd, there was a, set of a video on that one game alone. Oh my goodness, that is just a confusing mix of design. I've I've never seen anything else like it. That is crazy. One thing I've been getting into since we last spoke, Rob, is um, my friend Josh was telling me about uh, the Mario Maker, like people doing like super challenging levels in Mario Maker and trying to speed run through them. So yeah. I've been watching more of that. And it is crazy, some of those levels that people have designed for Mario Maker. Yeah, I, I only saw, um, like, within the first month after it came out, that's kind of how much attention I paid to it. But I can only imagine what the, the, the groups who have really gotten into it have come up with. Like, I don't even want to, I don't even want to take a look, because I feel like it would give me pain. Oh, yes, it's just insane, some of that stuff. Um... A big name YouTuber in the community. He did. He just released a game called uh, Super Dram World Two. I want to say that's the name of it. It's basically a ROM hack into Super Mario World that just completely 
adds in these insane levels. I you saw. Know, I did. I saw. I saw uh, a video of that. That is. That is crazy. Mm-hmm. It was a speed run. I saw a speed run of that. Oh, good. It could have been by the. I. I think we may have both watched the same video because I. Uh, it may have been done by the creator, Panga something. Oh, possibly. It was on uh, uh, Games Done Quick, Summer Day uh, Games Done Quick. Uh, I think there may be a new one of that, too, because they may have stream-run uh, Super Dram World 1 no, or Super Panga World, because two of the that big names that are... It. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I watched that one, too, from... I think it was la- it was just this year's uh, GDQ, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. That stuff is crazy. The whole idea, like the Kaizo block, where they just have invisible blocks purposely set up so that if you jump the normal way, it will get you killed. I mean, that just causes my inner game designer to have like a heart attack every time I think about that. Yeah. But they love that stuff, and it is just crazy to see what they put people through in that. Yeah, it's like the there was some major whiplash when in the uh, the two thousands and perhaps the late nineties when all the games seemed very nerfed and and people were just like, no, I want something almost supremely evilly hard. And so mm-hmm. you get games like that, and I can't remember. Oh, you got um, you want to be the guy, mm-hmm. uh, and and games like that where you know pixel perfect uh, things that are unfair in that you don't see what's coming, so you just have to learn as you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that kind of stuff drives me crazy, trying to play games like that. I did play I Want to Be the Guy, I think it was like a few years ago. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about it for one of the grab bag streams to try something like um, I Want to Be the Boshi or one of those other like crazy uh, Kaizo-based games and just see how insane it is. I was going to suggest a drinking game, but I think everyone would be dead in like 10 minutes of me playing a game like that on stream. Yeah. Every time no, Josh dies, certainly. take a drink. The whole <laughs> audience will be gone by like the ten minute mark of that. Yeah. Yeah, you'd have to do the opposite. Like every time you get past an obstacle, you take a drink. Uh, yeah. Then everyone will be sober for about yeah <laughs> <laughs> for the entire stream right there. Mm-hmm. I guess. Um, oh, uh, one other bit of good news in terms of uh, the YouTube channel, we are at right now just over. 2,170 subscribers, so we're pushing 2,200 right now. That is so, awesome. Congrats. Thank you, and thank you to everyone who is subscribing and enjoying the content. It looks like I'm, I didn't realize that we're actually over 500,000 views for the channel. So that's also really impressive, too. Again, that is awesome. Just in terms of the growth and everything. But yeah, getting back to like talking about like the whole Kaizo or the Mario Maker thing. It is very interesting to see how that stuff has grown. Um, a friend of mine, he also suggested I looked at Mega Maker. There's an actual Mega Man version of Mario Maker. That's freeware right now. And that was very curious. I don't know if it has the same legs, though. That's the only main concern. Or if Capcom decides to just pull the plug on it. Well, I mean, they could always pull the plug, but they could always embrace it. I mean, Mega Man uh, certainly is one of those games that just by existing it's already ridiculously hard so um it is one of those i mean certainly there's like ghosts and goblins which is Ugh. like that game for me boy that mm. but yeah those those games um they could easily just embrace it uh and and go with it uh especially given the the mario maker thing mm-hmm. man uh speaking about ghosts and goblins um, I think El Goro was the one who brought this up. There's this really good, like, spiritual successor to it called uh, Curse Castellia. That's, I think, there's a uh, EX version of it on Steam right now. That was pretty good. I'll have to check it out. Mm-hmm. I-, I thought you were going to say Ghouls and Ghosts, and I was like, oh, I know about that one. But <laughs> nope, as always, there's I also am learning. I saw on one of the uh, GDQs that there's someone's been working on a fan made version of Ghosts and Goblins that's still being worked on. So there's also that. You really want to go back to that one. But yeah, I need to also start thinking about this week's dissecting design coming up too. I've been so busy with typing and playing around with Adobe Photoshop that I haven't had a chance to think of the game yet. Uh, Let's see, any other games I've been playing? I did take a look at this uh, roguelike game called Tangle Deep. 
It's a uh, turn-based roguelite with like the 16-bit SNES graphics look. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't what I was looking for in terms of a roguelike. It's one of like the more like uh, classic examples, so it's a lot harder to get into if you're not familiar with it to begin with. Yeah, I did run across that one. I don't know if you had mentioned it before, and that's how I saw it, but when I see a game like that, that's when I, I start to, uh, like we were talking about earlier, that's when I start to say, well, I don't know if it embraced that art style. I don't know if it really made that art style its own. Mm -hmm. It seems like it used that art style, but it didn't go much further. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, again, like, when it comes to, especially in the competitive market, you can really see the difference between games that fully embrace it, like we talked about with Renowned Explorers and West of Loathing, and games that just simply mere, merely use it, whether it's for uh, technical limitations or even just simply financial limitations. Oh, that reminds me. There's this game that came out from Adult Swim Games a few weeks ago, like, of a very unique aesthetic. And I'm trying to see... Here it is, King's Way. If you have a chance, Rob, if you look at this game, it's basically all done like you're playing a Windows 95 interface. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I know what you're talking about. That's where you have a, a predetermined number of, like, days to get through. Is that the one? Uh, I don't think so. Let me, um, let me check it out. But yeah, the whole game looks like you're using a Windows 95 computer to play it. And like you have all these little different windows. One window represents oh. your world map, uh, character, stuff like that. I, I Hold on. I really have to see if that's... No, no, it, it is. It has a similar uh, look and feel to it. It might even be... Shoot. It, gosh, it looks so similar to one I saw at um, uh, E3 uh, a year ago. Uh, it looks so similar to one... And it's got the similarly old, like, you playing it on a PC aesthetic. I wonder, Andrew Morish. I'll have to, I'll look into this. I uh, <laughs> wonder if there's a, a pre, let's see here. Sorry. You go ahead. I, hope, <laughs> I will stop and do a, a quick search while, you, while we move forward. Okay. Now, I guess uh, we are, let's see, how are we doing time-wise? Looks like we're about 43 minutes in, so I figure we can go with maybe another one or two more big topics. So I guess one thing that we were talking about on Discord the other day that I want to bring up here to so what you folks think is regarding the idea or the uh, glitch or exploiting that was happening in PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds. What was essentially happening is that people are being banned for exploiting a known glitch. And of course, if you get banned from a multiplayer game, you can't really play it again, kind of unless you buy a brand new copy or get another account. And it brought up the argument regarding the use of glitches, especially in multiplayer-based games. And I guess for you, Rob, what do you think about that in terms of if someone is exploring a known glitch in an online game? Um, I mean, the way I look at it and what I had uh, put down on the thing before, and I don't know, I mean, I really do believe that it is... When the developer makes a game, the whole point of a game is that there are a set of boundaries, right? And in a in a video game, those boundaries are defined not necessarily by the rules you make up, but by the um, the software itself. So if there is a glitch, and even even the hardware, if there is a glitch and you know about it, then it's fixable. At least that's the idea, right? And if someone's make, taking advantage of that, well, it's in with it's within the realm of the rules insofar as anybody else can also take advantage of that glitch. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of like being an online um, like PvP and all that stuff, I feel like players can make their own rules with regards to that. So if there's a player who's known for doing that, they can kick them out or, or do something along those lines or have an, uh, a server where you're not allowed to use that or else, you know, something like that. But it's, a, it's such a hard thing to say because I mm -hmm. think the comparison I made before was in, in the world of, you know, physical sports... They're, they're, the rules are what bind the game. Mm -hmm. And there are plenty of, of ways to get around that, to cheese the system, so to speak. And, um, you know, teams have been getting away with that for years and years, and then every year they come up with a rule that might get rid of that ability. Uh, like the tuck rule, the infamous tuck rule. 
um, that uh, was taken advantage of a lot, um, that w lost someone in the Super Bowl, and then it was taken advantage of to where it could win someone in the Super Bowl. It was like things like that, I believe, are just part of the natural evolution of a game, and I feel like you need to embrace that. That's that's on that's my opinion anyway. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, hello, uh, Sungim. Thanks for coming on. Oh, uh, son. Oh, yeah, son. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> I I am I know son. Cool. Yeah, I'm like a lot of saying in chat, like instead of banning, they should be focused on fixing it. And I think I do yeah. generally agree with that. Like I talked about this in a post a while ago regarding cheating versus an exploit in a game. Like a cheat would be, of course, if I mod the game while I put in an aimbot. While an exploit is, of course, using, as we were just saying, some kind of in-game glitch or inconsistency in the programming to do something. And again, as you said, it's something that everyone can do because it exists within the game. Yeah. And I think I agree with Algor on that, that if you discover a glitch, it's up to the developers to do something about it. And um, I think we were talking about this on Discord, that the people that um, while they're trying to fix it or they're leaving it in, the developers have updated their terms of service to say that you cannot use any glitches or we will ban you. Mm -hmm. And that does, again, I don't know if I would really consider that, you know, solving the problem. No. I mean, certainly you could, instead of going nuclear, which is what I think kicking someone out of the game is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you could always suspend them. I, mean, I don't see a problem with suspending them until such time as either it's fixed or, you know, they can come back. But that's way better than um, kicking them out for good. Because like you say, you know, if you're a streamer, then that's you're dependent on being able to play with the community in, in those kinds of circumstances. So mm -hmm. uh, that, that really hurts. And to if you want, like, as a streamer, you'd want to showcase something that's unique. So you might want to show off a glitch once or twice. I feel like that's reasonable. So... Yeah. And then there's also the idea that, again, it goes back to that ever popular thing of who really reads the terms of service to see all yeah. the crazy rules. It's the same thing of people who or games that only have a manual and don't you know have any in-game tutorial. You can't expect someone to go outside your game to learn about it. You have yeah. to feature that stuff in there. Um, we are talking about Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, uh, Sun Game. And it's kind of what they were talking about with um, there's been like a whole lot of nasty PR regarding the Friday the 13th game. If you've heard anything about that, Rob. I have not. Well, if first they released the game at like a full price. It was like 40 or $50 without a single player mode. The multiplayer had all manner of bugs and issues with it. And then the developers started to ban players who either like say bad things in games and there's this whole nasty thing about um, apparently uh, people were helping someone cheat in the game. Uh, someone basically mailed off. They said, oh, we know developers. If you keep talking, we'll get you banned. He said, you know, go ahead and start cursing. And they basically, like, essentially pulled rank and told developers, this guy was being mean to me. You should ban him. And they did. And the developer was trying to defend it. They're saying we have proof, but then no proof came up. And Sheesh. it's just one of those things that it, it just feels like the slow moving car crash happening there. Yeah. And and then with uh, further things with Friday the 13th is the fact that they said that you must, they put all these weird rules and conditions, but they only have them on the terms of service on the website, not the game, but they're saying, oh, you agree to this stuff by launching our game. But you don't mention it when the person's installing it. Yeah. So it's just one of those things that, again, like I was talking to, and this will be tomorrow's podcast, we were talking about good management skills when it comes to being in the industry. Like, being able to plan this stuff out ahead, understand what kind of issues you can run into is such an essential part not only about building a successful game, but keeping, you know, the brand of your studio intact. Yeah, I think uh, Sun brings up an interesting thing, <laughs> that in, in Denmark, what they did there um, mm -hmm. said that that's not binding. That's pretty, 
That is that is a good because yeah they try to slip a lot of that stuff mm -hmm. uh, you know under the door, well because yeah no one reads that's pages and pages and you you pay for a game you don't expect there to be anything that's going to harm you because you gave them money, um, mm -hmm. it's it's kind of ridiculous. Yeah, and I don't know what else is going on with Friday the Thirteenth now. In fact, if we do a quick search of the game, I'm just curious what they're. So it retailed for forty dollars with just multiplayer, and even the multiplayer only has like I think two or three maps in it too. So mm -hmm. right now they moved back up from negative. They're right now just mixed. But and it's and that's another thing you really have to be careful of with a multiplayer game when you do bans like that. Oh, and also to add even more uh, fun to the fire there, or more fuel I should say, they also, when they did the Kickstarter, they committed the cardinal sin of having a Kickstarter exclusive in-game character that you can't get anywhere else. Yeah. yeah. And that's another thing we're, that will be on the podcast tomorrow. Pro tip for developers watching, be very careful about including backer exclusive content like that. And if you are going to do it, always offer it as an additional option in the future. Because, yeah. uh, as we talked about, people are more than willing to throw like 3 or $5 for something. They don't like it if you're told, you can't have this because we're not selling it anymore. Yeah. And um, El Goto is right. They also announced that the team is working on another multiplayer game. And they're, of course, saying that, oh, our team is so big we can work on multiple projects. But when you yeah. leave the game and say that's full of bugs and missing features, it mm -hmm. doesn't look well on the developer. Yeah, it, it definitely does not. Um, that that kind of stuff. Oh my god, it just makes me so mad. And going back to the whole, you know, banning somebody, it, it does seem like a double standard because you ban someone for exploiting something that's in your game, or or for um, not necessarily reading the thing, but. You know, people get on and they're racist and sexist and angry and swearing, and mm -hmm. and it seems like that's acceptable within a certain realm. So, mm -hmm. uh, it, I don't know, man. It's it, it's hip like hypocrisy. I mean, that's that's you know, AAA studios for you, or even yeah, the mm -hmm. Kickstarter thing. Oh gosh, it's garbage. It's so ugh. Mm -hmm. And I guess before we get back to talking about some of the bad stuff, I guess as a quick. Um, update, at least for something good. I was checking out uh, Pearson Games for their Cthulhu Wars, the Kickstarter for their latest version of that. I did a live cast with Arthur Pearson about, I think, two, three weeks ago. So right now, they are pushing just over $820,000 for their Kickstarter with three days to go. So, uh, congratulations to Pearson Games. Yeah. I would love to get a copy of that game. I just don't know if I would ever be able to play it with anyone, though. Yeah, no, that is that is the problem with physical games, is that they present a problem in terms of, you know, enjoying the game at all. Mm -hmm. I am going to ask him if there's any way to get a copy of it when the time comes just to do an unboxing, because I think I would really love to show that off, especially those figurines. I was telling Arthur, like, I wouldn't mind just having one of like, those Cthulhu displays, like, right here next to me on stream. You know, that would be, like, another little knick-knack for the background here. <laughs> yeah. But uh, getting back to the bad stuff, I was talking about this, I think, two weeks ago when you were still in mid-move, Rob. But have you heard of the story of what's going on with the Kickstarter for the game Unsung Story? Unsung Story? No, I haven't. Oh, you're going to love this one. This was a Kickstarter for a strategy RPG uh, made by the... The lead designer, one of the major guys behind the Tactics Ogre series, one of the most celebrated strategy RPGs. The Kickstarter was successful. They raised just over $660,000 for it. Mm -hmm. And apparently, the last few years, they couldn't put anything out. And oh, it's no. been so bad that they sold the rights to another developer oh my who gosh. revealed that basically everything that's been worked on is unusable. Oh, great. So it's just basically... I can't even think of anything like a good example, like a cascading failure for this Kickstarter. Oh, my gosh. 
It's it is obviously it is a poster child for what can go wrong with Kickstarter. Yeah. And they're saying that they're going to get a game out, but again, who knows when and where that will happen. Yeah, and uh, I'm looking at their Kickstarter page and I'm noticing whether this might be friends or family or whatever, but four people pledged over $2,500. Uh, five people at least did, uh, so nine people total pledged at least 1000 mm -hmm. So, you know, some people put real money into that game and, and the promises that came with it. Um, it, it do, does this new company have to are they obligated to fulfill all of these promises? And if so, I mean, if not, will they do it anyway? It's because like these people have been burned, obviously, and there's obviously a potential lawsuit here for that old company. So mm -hmm. that's oh gosh, it is. I hate hearing stuff like that, and yeah. yet it's all too often. Yeah, and Songum, I have not heard about the uh, Call of Cthulhu Seventh Edition Kickstarter, so I'm sure he'll type that in in a minute. Um. Another example that I'm really uh, uh, surprised about, and I hope it does turn out well, is uh, John Schaefer's game for At the Gates. He kind of ran to, uh, I, he. It's kind of hard to say. It was like either like an emotional strain or a financial strain, and he just like disappeared for like a year working on that game. He yeah. seems to be back, but I haven't heard anything else since. And I know again that there were a lot of people upset about that and again it is just it's very hard when you hear about stuff like that yeah and you know certainly the lack of money might cause any of those other issues so um yeah, yeah. I'm oh, looking boy. at his site right I'm looking at the uh, update or the kickstarter for at the gates and like his last message was in May and I hate to be I hate to be mean like this, but whenever I see a Kickstarter or I see a developer that just stops doing like regular updates, that's one of those I hear that little voice in my head telling me that something's gone horribly wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And are you talking about like was it in the middle of the Kickstarter that he stopped doing updates or just after the fact? After the, the Kickstarter. Yeah. Cuz uh, that's just it like for reassembly mm -hmm. and even for Venture Forth which did not succeed we made a point to go back into the Kickstarter because those people still get messages and they still enjoy, you know, being a part of it. It's something they wanted to have happen and it's nice to keep in touch with them. And so even with reassembly, which is years old now, uh, I would occasionally go back and see messages from people that say, Hey, I didn't get my key or something like that. And I'll just be like, okay, here's a key, whether or not they had already had one, because why not just mm -hmm. keep your people happy? Yeah. The, we, the one thing we did with venture forth, which was, it didn't wind up doing much good monetarily, but the guy went on to Reddit. He had a pretty decent Reddit following, and he posted that we gave him a game for for just even backing, uh, trying to back Venture Forth, and he just gave that, and we got like a thousand hits that day. So it was, I mean, it's nice to see that that happens, and it, it does go a ways uh, towards helping people and getting uh, good press. So it's good for, it's good for everybody. Mm-hmm. And especially with the idea of kickstarting and crowdfunding. Ooh, uh, just seeing what Sun posted. So I just, just as he typed that, I found the Kickstarter. So it was Kickstarter years ago, and then they suddenly put themselves all for sale and laid off all the staff. Oh, jeez. Yeah. And again, like when it comes to this kind of stuff with Kickstarter, like as we said, one bad apple can just spoil the whole bunch. And whenever we hear about a failure like this, it makes it harder for the next guy to do it, and the next one. And the same goes for early access and all the people who have now, you know, sworn off of it because of one bad game. Yeah, and one of my biggest pet peeves about Kickstarter, and I know it's not that, it's it's when a, a major developer, publisher, programmer, whomever goes on there, like one who's had major success and obviously has had some money goes on there and, and tries mm -hmm. to get a Kickstarter for them. And I just think think to myself, well, I mean, why do you need to do this? How do you how can't you go out there and find investors to help mm -hmm. you out given your track record uh, when there are people out there with great ideas and a decent following who would love to take part and be successful in a Kickstarter? Mm hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, and it's, of course it's different for companies that basically use Kickstarter. Like they say up front that we're basically funding everything via Kickstarter, so of course we're going to have multiple campaigns for it. Like uh, what they've done, with, like going back to Cthulhu Wars, like they've said that like this is their third reprinting or their third thing for it, but they've done other Kickstarters. And they've said, like, they, they spell it as clear as day that, you know, this is what we're doing to fund these games. So it's looked at a lot more favorably than, as you said, Rob, like someone who just made, you know, their last game sold, you know, they made like $50 million and now they're raising 200000 for a Kickstarter. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the, oh, God, famous famous designer adventure games. Um, I believe he worked at LucasArts. But, I mean, he was... Uh, doing Kickstarters for a lot of games and just getting loads of money because people love his games. But at the same time, that's think, money that. Uh, are you thinking of Tim Schafer? Yeah, Tim Schafer. Yeah, yeah. Because okay. I mean, yeah, he didn't. Nec- I don't. I don't see how he necessarily needed it to be crowdfunded, because I think a lot of these guys um, will go to crowdfunding route just to prove to an investor mm-hmm. that people are interested, and they get all this money. Uh, half from crowdfunding, even though they could have gotten it from an investor to begin with, and that that to me is a little, it's a little bit uh, iffy because all these people are paying these rewards and so, are paying these this money, and a lot of them aren't even gonna get a copy of the game for it uh, because they, mm-hmm. but they still gave money, and that that is a little disappointing. I, I don't know. It just yeah. it doesn't make me feel great inside, is all. Yeah. Now I guess going I guess balancing the bad with the good news, it was also reported that um, the game Kingdoms and Castles, which was funded using Fig, has managed to not only be successful but has actually turned a profit for the people who you know donated to Fig, you know, who bought shares in the game. Let's see if there's any more detail about it here. Yeah, I did see. I mean, I know that there are some of the crowdfunding things out there that do give shares out, and I think that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Um, that means that everybody either fails or succeeds with the game. So that that I believe does help a little bit. Um, certainly, it makes things complicated in terms of financing. But hey, you know, if you do it, you do it. You you embrace it and go with it. Hmm. Yeah. So it's good to hear about that. I'm really excited to see the game. Uh, Phoenix Point. Have you? Did you hear any news about that, Rob? No. no Phoenix, Phoenix Point. Point is the game from Julian Gollop, the original designer of XCOM, and it's basically his um, spiritual successor to the whole XCOM formula. Oh, cool. So I am really hoping that game turns out well. And of course, at the end of this month, the XCOM 2 expansion hits. And the whole Rayman, uh, no, not Rayman, Rapids and Mario XCOM game comes out too. Ha. Huh. That looks cool. Oh, yeah. I I don't want to get my hopes up for Phoenix because every time I get super excited about a game, it has burned me in the past. So I'm trying to keep myself from getting overly excited. Same goes for Mario V or Mario plus Rabbids. Oh, that's, yeah. I, I know that, um, I know that that kind of stuff is just retheming games and stuff. It, it's it's cheesy, but at the same time, it's it is a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And basically, Mario XCOM just sounds like too much of a dream idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Oh yeah, El Goy remind me, of course, of Cuphead, which I believe is going to be due out next month. So that's going to be another one that I'm going to be really keeping an eye on to see how it turns out. But yeah, it's very interesting to see how these games go through their process. I was just thinking about the whole Mighty Number no. 9 scandal and kind of like how I am still surprised how much the ball was dropped with that game. With one, I was, I was looking up Cuphead. Which game were you talking about? Mighty Number no. 9. Huh. I, I wish I feel like no, I don't. <laughs> That's the My, uh, game from Mega Man, the one of the developer, one of the original creators, uh, Keiji Inafune. Oh, okay, okay. And that we could probably spend a good forty minutes talking about, like it was nothing. <laughs> but yeah, again, it's just very tricky in terms of creating a game through a crowdfunding model, especially when you promise people our game's going to have this, 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 and this, 
but you haven't had a chance to actually build it yet. Yeah, and that reminds me of the Castlevania guy um, doing that same kind of thing. I mean, mm -hmm. as soon as you say he developed Mega Man or he developed Castlevania, fans get a very particular idea in their heads. So um, that is always... You can't live up to that. Um, I mean, I'm sure fans might like it, but when a fan comes up, a fan of a specific game, is expecting you to basically make that game times 10... Well, you're gonna, you are gonna get a lot of uh, hate out of that. Mm -hmm. It's a no win. It's a no win in that situation. Yeah, man. So like my number nine, they, they when they originally announced it, it had like this really uh, detailed like two D anime look to it. When it was released, it looks like a first generation like Unity game. Like it was like very blocky. You know, explosions look like pre made assets, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, the Castlevania game, I think you guys are talking about, was it Bloodstained? Something blood-related. Yeah, yeah I was, saw, like, ten seconds of footage of it when they were, like, doing, like, the teaser reel at E3. And, yeah, it's going to be one of those games that I'm just not sure if it's going to turn out well or not. And again, as you just said, Rob, whenever you say, or you're saying, oh, we're going to be making the spiritual successor to Mega Man or the spiritual successor to Castlevania you're putting yourself on a very lofty platform where you can fail very easily the same that kind of happened with a uh, ukulele and trying to go back to the old school the old 3D games oh yeah that's pretty I mean I'm sorry I'm looking at Cuphead and I am I am uh, I know loving it it looks amazing I don't, I don't have any screenshots of it up right now because I would be staring at it as well while we're talking so ukulele huh yeah oh we I feel like you brought this up before mm -hmm. oh hold on uh, if I type ukulele into uh, Chrome you might you might know what I get <laughs> yeah so bloodstained all right. And again, and and I think another great example of what you were talking about a few minutes ago, Rob, with you know the big name going to Kickstarter would be like Shenmue Three, mm, and yeah. what's been happening with that? And that is not a rhetorical question. I'm kind of curious what has been happening with it because I haven't heard anything out of it since the Kickstarter ended. Now, I want to say, I did see a, um, I mean, I didn't look at it much. The Shenmue series is not something that I had played in the past, mm -hmm. but I, I believe they had uh, something at E3. Uh, they had a booth. Mm -hmm. I do recall seeing uh, that that uh, property on display at E3. So there's something that's happening, yeah. I believe. Why is Kickstarter search not working for I me? I know. I've been noticing that, too. Yeah, so it looks like uh, Shenmue 3 is still going along. They do have somewhat regular updates to it, but let's see. So that's another one. That that company should not have to do Kickstarter. <laughs> My goodness. My goodness. <laughs> no problem, son. Yeah, but like with something like Shenmue, Again, oh, and I just remember my beer number nine. <laughs> Thank you, Elgar. I was thinking of that <laughs> joke myself as you were typing that. Uh, what I was about to say, um, another example of a classic game that's trying to come back is Toe Jam and Earl. Oh, um, yeah. And I know that I've been... I talked with the creator of that like a year or so ago. And I'm not sure what is happening with that one. Now, that is interesting. I mean, I just happen to have a, a, an interesting connection to that because uh, when I was doing my testing for when I when I started, I was doing testing for uh, what is now 2K Sports mm -hmm. or no, it was 2K Sports and now it's 2K Games or whatever. Um, in the same building, the Toe Jam and Earl guys were there and they leased out our testing team to do Toe Jam and Earl 3. So I, I got to listen to those sound effects all day, every day, and it was... Um, <laughs> I am done with that, but like, I just whenever I hear that property, I'm like, oh, okay, uh, great. <laughs> that's that's all that happens. Uh, but I'd, I'd be interested. It's a weird. That is a strangely um, like the way the game works, the procedural generation, like, and it's mm -hmm. been doing that from the beginning. Like, I, I I love the way they put that together. I think that that is 
I like crazy kooky concepts. Mm -hmm. I like the way they did that. It was very unique. So uh, maybe they can keep that going with a little more, you know, a added uniqueness and, and mm -hmm. pushing that envelope a bit. Yeah, definitely hoping I can talk to the designer of that game again. It was, it was a lot of fun talking to him. And again, very interesting franchise, especially how it kind of got, you know, through the whole thing from back in the Genesis era to Xbox and such. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, speaking about games that have had that um, uh, weirdness to them. Oh, what was the thing I was saying? Oh yeah, about weird sound effects. Uh, the PSP game Patapon. If you've ever heard of that one. It's a uh, music I base. Have. Oh, good. <laughs> it's a music based like RPG. So you, in order to play, you have to have the music up really loud to listen to the beat. I just drove my family crazy playing that game. All they heard was the same like five notes over and over again for like two hours. Yeah, no, I d I did play that a long time. I loved the visuals there, um, but yeah, that that I got sick of that game pretty quickly. I thought, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was it was a very neat concept. Um, that that uh, excuse me, mm -hmm. that was one of those few handheld devices that I owned. Uh, the PSP, I, I actually, for whatever reason, I owned that. I owned that and the DS. Not the DS, sorry, the um, whatever. But that that was an interesting game. It, you, just like you say, the, the music gets a little <clears throat> old after a while, but, like, it, it was. It was very cool. It was very neat to watch and look at, and I could I could enjoy watching some streams of that game, I, I do believe. Yeah. And as Olga was saying in chat, yeah, the second game was completely different from the first one. I remember when I spoke with the designer about that one, too. Like, about some of the manage, uh, managerial issues that they ran into with trying to create a second Toe Jam and Earl game. Gaming brings new material to the divorce court. Yep, exactly. <laughs> uh, let's see. I know we are over our hour for our chat yeah. but I guess um, any I guess final topics for this week do you have anything Rob? Well I did want to bring up I did find that game when you brought up that uh, King whatever what is it called the King's Kingsway King, yeah I found the game that I was thinking of it's called Royals I'm sure you've heard of it uh, indie game from a couple of years back but it, it, it is like a very old like almost Let's Apple see. IIe kind of look to it uh, it's free to download, free to play. Okay. Uh, it's it's very fun, um, but it it had a that's what I was thinking of when I saw uh, Kingsway. But obviously, Kingsway's got a very interesting twist uh, with all those uh, the windows and all that stuff you get to manipulate. I think that's kind of neat. Yeah. Oh, here's a little bit of news I was just thinking about. They've announced there's been a massive update to No Man's Sky that just came out. Ooh. Yeah. Um, yeah. Literally today big update to the game adding and more content it's actually it's also on sale right now on steam for like twenty four dollars i am hmm. sure if i try to put that game on this computer my computer will blow up so i don't <laughs> think i'll be showing it off here anytime soon but it, it's that's definitely one of those very weird games right now especially in terms of as we talked about uh, doing post-release support on a game like that yeah, I know that they had, uh, they certainly had some troubles uh, uh, when mm -hmm. they launched. Uh, I haven't looked at their their uh, ratings recently. I know that the last time I looked, it was still miserable. And I, the frustrating thing about that game is that with those miserable ratings, people still bought it. And that that to me was just, it felt, I felt cheated as a publisher when when yeah yeah we're still at um, mostly negative, thirty two percent rating on Steam. With the recent ratings being much higher at 63%, but mm -hmm. you know uh, what happened to looking at the reviews before you before you buy a game? I, that's this is the one game that seems to be the exception to the rule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it also was kind of like the weird thing I saw with um, uh, Halcyon Six that I talked about earlier in the cast that when the game came out, it was done like it had the content in there it was a complete game and then they just kept adding and adding new stuff to it and now it's almost a completely different experience so they actually did yeah. a re-release of that and that's the light speed edition of what I'm playing now but with something like No Man's Sky 
it's such a very weird situation to see them. I mean, on one hand, I guess it's good that they're continuing to keep improving it, but on the other hand, I don't really think they have much of a choice. Like, no, if, they, no. if they don't improve that, you know, that company is dead. And I'm sure, like, anyone who's worked at that company will probably be blacklisted once people find out. Well, certainly there's going to be that. I mean, there's no arguing how great that game looks. It looks amazing. Yeah. But the fact that it has such bad reviews with such an amazing looking game is what gives me great pause. Like, mm -hmm. uh, and I've heard what the complaints are. I've read the complaints. I've read a lot of good reviews that are good and reviews that are bad because it is confusing to me how a game that looks that amazing is such such a low piece of crap rating. Mm -hmm. And it just obviously that their their content was the problem. Not only the content wasn't the problem, mm -hmm. uh, but it was a huge problem. People ran through the content really fast, uh, and it, it brought me flashbacks of Spore which, you know, burned me bad enough, at least in my opinion. Oh, it yes. did not reach my expectations. But it was the same problem here, is that they set lofty expectations. And, you know, they might have meant one thing, and, and the people took it as another, but that's what happened, and so you got to own that somehow. Mm-hmm. And again, like, and there's also the issues of them, like, not meeting all the promises they said, um, there is, of course, the infamous day one patch. I guess here's a quick aside for you, Rob. What do you think about the whole idea of a day one patch? And basically, again, like continue to work on a game, and then when the game comes out, you immediately patch it to what you've been working on for whatever how many days or weeks it's been. Um, well, I mean, I come from the day of uh, even working on games. It was hard media, so you mm -hmm. you had no you could not do a patch. It was it was unheard of. So. Um, the the day of launch patch just it does irk me a bit. Like your game should be polished and ready enough for people to mm -hmm. buy it and play it for several weeks. Like, and they're being bugged and you need to fix them because you have such a scale of testers that you did not have. But um, mm -hmm. that that understandable. But the fact that you would add patches right then it's it's, it's a little disconcerting. Why didn't you just before you launched it? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, I think you were cutting out there just a little bit, Rob. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, basically, I was just, if you can, if I don't cut out again, I was just saying that uh, the one, the, the day one patch just seems, you, I think, yeah, uh, El Gordo says uh, the one day delay. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that is a perfect solution because that's, that's very understandable. We had a couple last minute adjustments. We're going to mm -hmm. um, bump by one day. It's not like they're by months is what, is what usually is the case. Um, that it, it brings up another game to my mind, Roller Coaster Tycoon World. Mm -hmm. My my goodness, like just read up on that, watch some videos of it. It is, it is a fun ride, so to speak. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think we are definitely getting up there. Yeah, we're approaching about yeah. an hour and twenty. I'm sure uh, you have to get back to packing at some point, Rob. So unpacking, I think. Unpacking. Yes. Oh yeah, unpacking. My mistake. So I think we will wrap things up for this week. If you are new and enjoy things, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Again, if you'd like to chat with us on our Discord channel, you can find it's only a dollar a month over on patreon.com slash GWBicer. I'll be putting up the vote for the uh, grab bag uh, voting this Sunday. And be sure to tune into the podcast over on GameWisdom.com tomorrow for those of you watching this live. Uh, Rob, as always, thank you so much for being my co-host. And do you think that you'll be able to gain back to streaming this week, or do you think you'll probably be a little bit longer? Um, I do think my plan is to, because I'm in a closet now, I, I'm really going to be broadcasting from here on out. So I just have to clean out this place and set up, and I can do that by tomorrow. In which case, I'm going to try my hand at speedrunning, and I put quotes around speedrunning Titan Quest. We'll see how that goes. And maybe one of these days I should try speedrun. I just, I just can't think of any game I would be good at or crazy enough at to try and go through that fast. Yeah, yeah. It, it, this one I, I have. I'll basically be cheating because someone mm -hmm. gave me like a really powerful uh, set of armor. <laughs> uh, so I'm just gonna run through easy mode as fast as I can and just claim that I'm I'm speedrunning. So I'm gonna have to. I'm not gonna use that tag when I when I do it, or else I'll, I'm sure I'll get uh, get hung out to dry. But whatever. <laughs> All right. 
And for those of you watching this live, be sure to come back probably in 30 minutes or so when I will be jumping back into West of Loathing for the evening. I'll be punching cows and drinking sarsaparilla and sticking my hands in random spittoons and seeing what comes out of it. So be <laughs> sure to check that out then. And of course, for those of you watching this recorded, that will be obviously archived here on the channel. So. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. We do these live shows usually Thursdays around 9 EST here. And again, if you are watching this live or record, be sure to tune into my live stream this Tuesday, that is August 15th, around 4.30 EST, where I will be talking to the creators of West of Loathing. That will be a whole lot of fun, and I'll let you know about that second cast as well. So... With that said, thank you so much for tuning in. And again, Rob, thanks for coming on. I'm sure we'll be talking on Discord as well as our chat next week. Oh, of course. I am uh, always look forward to these, so I'll, I'll talk to you soon. All right. So with that said, folks, thanks for tuning in. Hopefully uh, the hotkey is going to work when I hit it to stop streaming. But thanks again for tuning in, and we will catch you all again next week. And am I out? Uh, I don't think it stopped streaming. Well then, that should be fun. Let's try this way. Okay, this time for real, thanks for tuning in.